for many people, 1994 seems like it was only a few years ago, but it has, in fact, been the best part of 30 years since we got to fire up our SNESs and Mega Drives to play games like Donkey Kong Country, Earthworm Jim, and Super Metroid. Can someone send help? I think the boys are having an existential crisis. Those of you who are old enough probably have a lot of fond memories of gaming circa 1994, and we're here once again to sully those memories by reminding you of all the horrible games that were also released in that 12 month period. As is always the case for these sort of lists, we've scoured the murky depths of game rankings to find the, let's say, less than great titles released in 1994. In order to qualify for a spot, a game must have received a minimum of seven professional reviews. And the bouncers here at Club Triple Jump are pretty vigilant, so it's no good trying to sneak past with fewer. I'm Ashton from Triple Jump, and here are the 10 worst games of 1994. Number 10, King's Quest 7, The Princeless Bride, PC, 60%. We're kicking off our list with a game that wasn't necessarily what you'd call bad, but it was worse than most others that were released in 1994. By the time The Princeless Bride was released, the King's Quest series was already well established, having debuted in 1984 with Quest for the Crown. The reception of each game varied, though they could generally be relied upon to deliver puzzles and adventures with a fairy tale twist. King's Quest VII was no exception, though it didn't fare as well with critics as some of its predecessors. The game follows Queen Valonice and Princess Rosella as they are transported to the realm of Eldritch. After Rosella is transformed into a troll, the duo must find a way of turning her back, all whilst ridding the realm of evil forces and finding their way back home. Whilst the game was playable, a number of critics and fans were upset at the Disney-style graphics, which were a departure from those seen in the series' previous titles. Aside from that, most felt that The Princeless Bride didn't bring anything new to the table. The story was fine, the puzzles were okay, but overall, the game was nothing special. Number 9, Ecstatica, PC, 60%. I'm not going to lie, when we unearthed this, uh, gem, we thought that a naughty magazine had got mixed up with all of the bad video games, but we'd like to assure you that Ecstatica is, in fact, a piece of software for the PC, and not a nudie thing. Ecstatica is set in the year 928 AD, and sees players taking on the role of a traveller arriving in the northern European town of Tirich only to find that the whole place has been overrun by demons. Not ideal, but still better than what happened to those blokes in Hostel. Naturally, it falls to the player character to rid the town of its unholy problems by freeing the sorceress Ecstatica from her possession. Though Ecstatica did receive some praise for its storyline and sense of humour, it failed somewhat at what it was trying to do, i.e. be a horror game. The visual presentation was more Teletubbies than Alone in the Dark, and although 3D graphics were still in their infancy at that point, the cuddly looking bubble characters are unforgivable in a game that's meant to give you the willies. In short, if Ecstatica had been marketed as an adventure title rather than a survival horror title, it might have been better received. Oh well, lesson learned, eh? Number 8, The Death and Return of Superman, SNES, 58.63%. The Death and Return of Superman was once described by a well-known publication as being the best Superman game ever made. Considering the fact that more or less all of the other Superman games have been utter plops, however, that isn't really saying very much. It seems like Superman's only weaknesses are kryptonite and his ability to make good video games. In terms of functionality, The Death and Return of Superman worked as a game should. If you pressed a button on your controller, Superman would do the thing that was assigned to that button. Additionally, the story wasn't bad, though it was based on the comic book The Death of Superman, so we can't exactly give the game that much credit for its plot. Sadly, The Death and Return of Superman was guilty for the same sin as many other superhero adaptations. It was a soulless beat-em-up. Don't get me wrong, we like beating nine bells out of a bunch of goons, but the game made little use of its license. You could have swapped out Superman for basically anyone else, and still gotten the same basic experience. Still, at least it wasn't as bad as Superman The New Adventures. Number 7, Wolfenstein 3D, SNES, 58.33%. Honestly, we are as shocked as you are about this one. 
Originally released in 1992, Wolfenstein 3D is considered by many to be one of the greatest video games of all time. Though it may look a little quaint by today's standards, at the time it was a technological triumph, with everything from its 3D graphics to its exceptional FPS gameplay garnering praise from critics. Without Wolfenstein 3D and one or two other titles from the time period, it's likely that the modern first person shooter genre would look very different. So why was it so badly received on the SNES? The main issue was that it wasn't a direct port of the original game. Furthermore, each of the levels was simplified in order to allow it to run on the SNES. The port did add power-ups and a couple of new weapons, but this was nowhere near enough to make up for the severe lack of content. If you had absolutely no other alternative, then Wolfenstein 3D for the SNES was playable at least, but it was far from the best way to experience the title. Great game, poor choice of machinery. Number 6. Noctropolis, PC 56.67% We've already heard from Metropolis, now get ready for Noctropolis, a game that's sure to knock your socks off with how rubbish it is. Noctropolis follows the exploits of Peter Gray, a lonely bookshop owner that finds himself sucked into the world of his favourite comic book. Once there, he becomes the Batman-like Darkshear, a superhero without superpowers, and must protect Noctropolis from the villains that are wreaking havoc across the city. Though Noctropolis looked rather nice, it was severely lacking in substance. The premise and setting did garner some praise, but critics admonished the plot for being derivative, both of other video games and comic books. Additionally, the game was criticised for using shock value to distract from its lack of ideas, prioritising graphic violence and sexy bits over an interesting story and engaging gameplay. The puzzles also caught a lot of flack, as players found they were generally illogical and required them to use trial and error rather than any kind of brain power. With a bit more creativity from the devs and some competent brain teasers, Noctopolis could have been a slam dunk in the point and click space. Sadly, it ended up being all cape and no superpowers. Number 5 Double Dragon 5 The Shadow Falls SNES 52.75% we come now to the first of several titles on this list that attempted to cash in on the success of Street Fighter 2, only without any of the charm of Capcom's legendary fighting game. Up until the release of The Shadow Falls, the Double Dragon franchise had consisted of a series of beat-em-up titles, so Double Dragon 5's departure from the format was somewhat of a shock to fans. A change of genre isn't necessarily a bad thing, but unfortunately for Double Dragon 5, the developers decided to rip off Street Fighter 2 rather than bringing anything new to the table. In all fairness to Double Dragon 5, it was a fairly competent fighting game. The sprites looked quite nice, there was a decently sized roster of characters to choose from, and the game controlled quite well. The main thing that let it down was the complete lack of originality, leaving critics wondering why anyone would bother with it when Street Fighter 2 was right there. One of the only notable differences between the two was that Double Dragon 5 featured moves that were easier to perform than those in Street Fighter 2, though this did mean the game was far less challenging than it could have been. Oh well, they say imitation was the sincerest form of flattery. Right? Number 4 The Journeyman Project Turbo PC 50% if there ever was a title that proved that just fixing your technical flaws won't magically transform you into a good game, it's The Journeyman Project Turbo. The game was a re-release of 1992's The Journeyman Project and aimed to remedy a number of technical issues that marred the original. All credit to the developers, Turbo did resolve the load time problems of its predecessor, and players found that their machines were able to handle it much better. Sadly, it failed to address any of the other problems that made The Journeyman Project a bit Math. The game is set several hundred years into the future, and players take on the role of Gage Blackwood, a man whose job it is to prevent people from manipulating the past through means of time travel. Earth is about to negotiate its entry into the symbiotry of peaceful beings, but some dastardly git has altered history so that Earth's first contact with the aliens is hostile rather than peaceful, and it's up to Gage to sort it all out. The Journeyman Project Turbo did receive some praise for its graphics and storyline, but many critics felt that these were prioritised over actual gameplay, leaving players with a short title filled with lacklustre puzzles. I guess you could say that the developers didn't properly gauge the situation. Number 3 Clay Fighter Genesis 49% we do kind of have to hand it to Clay Fighter, because although the game wasn't particularly good as evidenced by its pitiful score of just 49% on game rankings, the developers did, at the very least, try something new with its graphics. Enjoy that praise, Clay Fighter. 
you won't be getting any more. The game itself was of the fighting persuasion, and was intended to be a parody of Street Fighter. As such, players could expect to choose from fighters like Blue Suede Goo, an Elvis impersonator that throws musical notes at his opponents and is able to use his hair as a weapon, and Icky Bod Clay, a pumpkin-headed ghost that launches balls of ectoplasm at his foes. Unique graphics and pun-based characters do not a good time make, though, and players soon found that once the initial laughs had worn off, there wasn't much left to hold their interest. The controls were clunky, which made the game challenging, but once players got used to them, they found they could easily breeze through the whole thing in just a few hours. What's more is that one thing Clay Fighter did have going for it, i.e. its claymation graphics, didn't carry over well from the SNES to the Genesis, leaving players with a game that was more mortifying than it was Mortal Kombat. Number 2, Shaq Fu, SNES, 44.5%. If we ask you to list celebrities who might appear in their own fighting games, the likes of Chuck Norris or Bruce Lee might spring to mind. Unless you're familiar with Shaq Fu, then it's unlikely that you'd immediately settle on Shaquille O'Neal. But here we are. As you might suspect, Shaq Fu was not a good game, but was rather a shameless money grab that set out to cash in on the popularity of professional basketball player Shaq. The story follows Shaq as he's transported to another dimension, where he must rescue a young boy called Nezu from the clutches of the evil mummy, Set Ra. Like you, I am keen to find out what kind of drugs the developers were on when they came up with that premise. The main problem with Shaq Fu was the fact that it was an utter failure of a fighting game. The likes of Street Fighter 2 is at the bar pretty high, and so when Shaq Fu stumbled onto the scene with poor controls and a lack of moves, players were not impressed. Throw into the mix the laughable plot and sprites so small you needed a microscope to see them, somewhat ironic when you consider that Shaq himself is 7 foot 1, and you've got a game that really has Shaq the bed. And number 1, Dreamweb, PC, 30%. Cyberpunk 2077 may have been a bit of a letdown, but compared to the cyberpunk point-and-click title Dreamweb, it's nothing short of a masterpiece. Dreamweb tells the story of Ryan, a bartender whose nights are filled with horrifying dreams and whose days are plagued by blackouts and strange visions. He learns that this is all connected to the Dreamweb, a barrier that protects the world from darkness, and that he must destroy the seven evil entities that seek to destroy it. Dreamweb was yet another example of a game that attempted to use shock to hide the fact it didn't have much to offer. The story lacked depth and nuance, the UI took up approximately 94% of the screen, and the bland puzzles were made even more frustrating by the fact that players could pick up literally any item they came across, even if they had no use. Perhaps the most interesting thing about the game didn't even happen during its runtime. The original release came with a diary that gave players more information about the story and the world, and though it was a Approximately as well written as a Twilight fanfiction, it did at least give the whole thing a bit of heart. Dreamweb, more like Dream Pleb, <laughs> got him, 